Hello, everyone. This is one of another edition of Brazilian Beyond Borders. Today, we have a very, very, very special guest. Growing up, Thais Russomano always dreamed to become an astronaut and live in space. Many kids of young age have similar dreams, which eventually vanish as they grow up, but they did not for Thais. She graduated as internal medicine doctor in Pelotas, Brazil, my country, my state, then continued her career with master degree in aerospace medicine and even PhD in space physiology fields. That she has been working and teaching for 30 years. Thais, would you tell us about your journey from Pelotas, Brazil, to becoming a globe person? So you have no idea how much delighted and happy we are to have you here today. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here and somehow by sharing my story, make maybe uh, inspire and motivate uh, other people. So as you said, my, my, my childhood dream, and if you ask me when it started, I don't remember. Uh, it, people, my mother, my, my family say that it was about um, when I was about four or five years old, that um, by that time, uh, if you, we, you observe you know, the, the world at that time, it was the moment that um, Neil Armstrong was uh, stepping on the moon for the first time, you know, was, uh, the Apollo project, Apollo 11 mission. And I was the one that uh, stayed up uh, till midnight uh, by myself to watch it happening. So at that time I was um, four years old, five years old. And uh, so my mother said, well, it's had to st have started before that because otherwise wouldn't stay up till midnight by yourself just to watch the, uh, to watch you know, the men stepping on the moon. So I was born maybe with that dream. I don't know what happened to me, but um, it shaped my life you know, for many, many years. I, I thought that I was uh, this, uh, the astronomy or astrophysics would be my hobby because it was also a consensus in my family that I needed to have a proper profession and by proper profession that meant like uh, to be a lawyer as all my family, you know, my relatives are lawyers or, or to be a medical doctor or an engineer. Uh, so I had you know, to choose a profession and, uh, and I thought, well, maybe it is, uh, maybe it's the right thing to do. I will become a, uh, a medical doctor and I will have a space as my hobby. Uh, when I was young, again, uh, about eight years old, nine years old, I established a club for kids uh, in, in English to be something related to astronomy for kids. And uh, I was the president, of course. <laughs> and that this, um, it was just expressions of my passion. I wrote a book about space when I was uh, 11 years old or so. And it was the, um, the foreword was given by a very important um, uh, writer here in Brazil, in, in coming from that also is from Porto Alegre, Rio Grande do Sul, Eric Veríssimo. So many Brazilians will know him. And um, so it was a real, a real passion. No? I can't deny that. And the, but I studied medicine. I was happy with my uh, my career that I was uh, establishing. But at the end of my medical school, I. I was visiting my uncle that at that time was a psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland. And I was visiting him and we found out together that there was a course in Dayton, Ohio, the only one open to civilians at a master's level in aerospace medicine. And then it clicked inside of me. It's the, the, I have the possibility to, to connect, you know, to, to combine my passion with my 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 profession so it was the perfect storm <laughs> but i had to finish my medical school i did my residence training for four years here in, in at the astrology clinic in porto alegre i i worked as a, a terrestrial doctor let's say for a couple of years in intensive care units emergency rooms hospitals and then i felt prepared then to go to the united states I did my master's, a two year, it was a two year degree. Then I went to, to, to London to, to do a PhD in space physiology at King's College. Uh, it was an excellent experience. I really learned a lot at that period. 
And uh, from there, I went to Germany, spent three years in work uh, in the in a space agency, the, the, one of the campus of uh, the German space agency uh, called DLR in Cologne. And I really loved the experience as well. But for me, I, I don't know, it was like a, a projects in space agents, they are extremely uh, big, you know, they are very important, they are, they are very political sometimes, and, uh, uh, and I wanted to have more this academic experience, uh, so that's when I decided to establish a center in Brazil of uh, space life science called the microgravity center at uh, in a university, private university, PUC and yes, in Porto Alegre. And then uh, from there, I, I, I connected, let's say, the center that started extremely small. Now, it was me, a computer, and a desk, so it couldn't be smaller than that. And then it, I connected with many different countries, universities, of course, with uh, connections that I had already in the United States, uh, in Germany, in England, King's College, and so on. And then it was growing and growing and growing. Uh, when I left seven, 18 years later, uh, this desk and this computer uh, became a 700 square meter uh, center with uh, nine different labs under this uh, center. Uh, so it was a fantastic uh, experience. And um, unfortunately, then after I left, uh, there, there was uh, lots of changes in Brazil. And, uh, and unfortunately, the center now is closer. But it was, uh, for a moment, it was, I would say, one of the best places in the world, in a university, to study and, um, and learn about uh, uh, the human presence in space, human space exploration, and other areas, aviation as well. And we had also a lab in telehealth, digital, digital health. So we, uh, it was a very good experience. Uh, I continued my career, you know, after the uh, after leaving Brazil. Uh, I'm academically linked to many different universities, King's College, still uh, university in Finland called Alpe University, uh, university in uh, in in Germany, uh, the uh, uh, the Faculty of Medicine in Portugal, wow. three universities here in Brazil. Uh, one is uh, UFSPA here in Porto Alegre. Uh, and uh, two master, two uh, uh, not master, sorry, um, specialization course of post, uh, post uh, grad courses in uh, in aerospace medicine in São Paulo, different universities. So it is a uh, it is a very good experience to be you know, keep uh, let's say my connections with uh, colleagues, professors, and students. Uh, um, to teaching online because every, everything is happening online nowadays. And I, uh, my third phase of my career, let's say, I started as a medical doctor, then I'm more like an academic, and now I'm uh, also an entrepreneur with a new company, a startup company called Inov Space, uh, dedicated to the areas of uh, the expertise that I have, space, uh, aviation, other extreme environments, and digital health. Inov Space is a British company uh, established about uh, two was three years ago. Thais, you know, we're in 2021, and when, when we talk about space, and for the majority of people, they think a lot about science fiction and movies and stuff, but, but you know, it's like for the first time over a decade, this is very recently, the European Space Agency started seeking for new astronauts. And then we had the, the, the government of the former president, Donald Trump, who create a space for for United States of America, and then I, I'm, I'm reading all your your background, your work, and stuff like that, and and I see like you also said, and, and I hear that it, it, you also believe the first humans to go into Mars, they already they probably already born. So it, it's like it, you know, but the majority of the people they are still thinking space. It is a science fiction, but it looks like. It, it, most of for us, we have to understand it's a reality, right? No, no, for sure. It's uh, our life is full of uh, space science, and we use that and uh, uh, all the time, you know, to, to to do many things in our lives. So it is not, um, of course, not uh, uh, let's say just a human space exploration. You have uh, satellites. You have uh, ways to uh, manage or, or at least. Um, 
observe the, 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 the earth, you know, the climate and so on. So there is the, the is, uh, spaces in our daily life, you know, for telecommunication, for, for many things. The spin-offs are enormous, you know, the, the amount of spin-offs that we have in many different areas. So, so it, is, uh, it is in our daily life. Uh, and I agree with you when you say that um, uh, for most of people in the world, it's uh, still like a, like a game or, or a science, science fiction or uh, TV program, a uh, movie on the, on the cinema and so on. But I think that it is one of the reasons that I established in our spaces because I think that it, there is a kind of message behind this approach or this attitude that is um, that space is for some countries to develop, you know, to, to, to progress with the research and, and the so on and so forth, the analogy, uh, and for the rest of the world to play with. And I think that that's not the case. I think that uh, space is really, really the final frontier, is, is, uh, is the science that uh, represents uh, humanity. And uh, that's why we, when I establish North Space, the ethos of North Space is the space without borders. And by borders, uh, I, we understand that's not just geographic borders, but language or religion or gender or, or faith or whatever, you know, find someone should not be a, a barrier for, for the space knowledge to be, uh, to, to be used. You know. So that's why, in fact, for example, we work with, uh, from El Salvador to Australia or from Guatemala to Zimbabwe, from um, England to the Philippines and, uh, and so on. Uh, I think that that's one of the main drives of you know, spaces to uh, to change this perception. Space is for everybody to enjoy <laughs> science fiction, and it's for everybody to uh, work as a, as, a, as a career, as a professional uh, in many different fields. So I think that we need to change that a bit so it's not confined in, in, in some countries. Thais, now we have uh, Linus Shelgren, who is a, a co-founder of a Globe Patient Group. And he also has a study uh, space technology and Kiruna Sweden also study a medicine technician. So he would like to make some questions to you. And I, I, I and you know, the now the conversation will be way more technical, but you know, and it's like you have no idea how much all this has been adding to our uh, program here. Thank you very much. Welcome. My pleasure. Hello, great to be here. Uh, during this pandemic, people have practiced social distancing and we have all been troubled and stressed by it. Space is also a stressful, hostile environment. There's no air in space, you can't go off, you can't go anywhere. How does uh, stress affect astronauts physically and what means exist for them to combat it? Yeah, no, it's a very good question because there is this type of parallel what, what is happening here on Earth now. And uh, in some of my lectures, I used to say that uh, uh, now the, the, the Earth, the, the whole planet became a kind of spaceship. And we are all astronauts you know, locked in. <laughs> so we are um, confined and isolated. But um, and we can learn some uh, with, with what the astronauts or how the astronauts handle the situation. So th there are some differences that we need to understand. You know, the astronauts in the space, they are extremely well selected and trained. So when they get there, they are prepared for that somehow. And here on Earth, of course, most of us uh, are not prepared for what, uh, for a pandemic, for this isolation and the confinement, especially people that are sick or old and you know, families that are, let's say, couldn't see each other, you know, family members, uh, friends, uh, even kids, you know, are, away from their friends and so it's it's quite a, a very stressful uh, situation on top of that many people getting sick and dying so the scenario is not the same but there are some uh, let's say lessons that we can learn from space uh, the, the astronauts as i said they are uh, extremely well selected and trained and physically and mentally so psychologically they are aware that they are going to be in this, um, this very a confined environment, isolated from everyone and everything, with no references. You now the, the the old references that they used to have, they are completely gone. And um, uh, but as I mentioned, they are prepared somehow. 
and they create ways to deal with that. First of all, they have a mission that, uh, that has a, a beginning and an end. That is, uh, there are risks involved, but it's not like to have a disease, you know, if you are not sick to go into space, you know, because you are, you are an astronaut, you are the opposite, you are very healthy. So you, you, you these are uh, important, important difference, you know, that if, if, if in, at first, in the beginning of the pandemic, someone could come, uh, could have come, came and said, oh, we are going to have that for one year and eight months and 15 days, everybody was counting down. So somehow, because the astronauts, they know that they are going to be there for a month, six months or a year, it, it has a, a, an ending site. So it changes this confinement um, perception. Also, because nowadays they can really communicate their families, although of course not in person, but virtually it helped them a lot. And one thing that's very important is that they, they keep a routine and they keep their goals. And I think that that's something that we, uh, in, in many circumstances here on Earth, uh, we miss at that point. You know? So some societies, some groups in society, they suffered more because they were incapable somehow of dealing with the new timetable, new schedules, the, uh, that they could work from home so they could sleep in the afternoon a bit and, or watch a movie. And then they, they were like, maybe not sleeping at night. And, and this disrupts the, the diet, this disrupts the exercise that you should do every day. This disrupts the medication that you are taking. So there are, there are things that you can learn from the astronauts, especially these uh, two aspects you know, the, that you are, uh, that you should, should, must keep a routine, even if you do not have to go out for your work or to go out to see your friends, you should keep a routine. You should keep uh, um, uh, your goals, you know, so whatever it is related to your work or even to have social, virtual interaction with your friends. So there are things that you can bring, you know, as, a, as a, of course, they are in a, as I said, it's, there are similarities, there are differences, but trying to, uh, based on, let's say, my, my, my answer in the similarities, we need to, to see that uh, we can learn from them, although, of course, they are more prepared and trained for this type of situation, and they are not suffering or afraid of a disease that can catch them out of the blue and put them in a hospital intensive care, and, or, or not just them, but a, a relative you know, or someone that they love. And so it is... Um, it's a very interesting uh, comparison, I think, and it's another spin-off, more, more towards the psychosocial side of uh, human space exploration. How is it to provide health assistance with a restricted set of resources, such as medical tests, medicines, medical apparatus? None of those you can put up there because of uh, the limited load for every launch. Yeah, no, you're right. It is it is always always tricky because we do not have a doctor on board all the time. There are missions that we have medical doctors that are qualified astronauts, space medical doctors, space doctors that are uh, flying, you know, with the part of the crew. But let's say normally, you, know, you have um, you have telemedicine, you know, digital medicine that helps to connect the ground with the astronauts during the flight, and they are important for three main reasons. You know? First, because even, even if you're not sick, when you are in space, your body starts changing. Your body and your mind respond to be in this uh, confined, isolated environment with microgravity and radiation. Uh, so lots of psychosocial and physical aspects of my space mission that affect uh, your body. And then this, uh, this physiological change, for example, it's interesting to be somehow monitored from the ground. Uh, also because uh, you can have a, a clinical situation or a disease that happens, uh, the astronaut can get sick. So on top of this physiological change, you can have a disease. And uh, even worse than that, you can have uh, some uh, medical emergency. So for these three reasons, it's very important to have a good connection between uh, the, the, the spaceship, the, the space station and the ground, the control, control center. And it is also important uh, for some, uh, let's say, daily activities, like uh, are, are the astronauts exercising as they should, two hours a day, two and a half hours a day? Are they eating properly? Are they sleeping well? So this is also well-being and health issues. Though. So this is, this is uh, how you, uh, 
the importance, let's say, of having telemedicine. You need that all the time. It is easy to have that nowadays with the technology that you have. If you, if you, the, 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 the mission is, in, is called LEO, you know, Low Earth Orbit. So the LEO missions, uh, the astronauts are about 400 kilometers from the ground which gives a possibility of a real-time communication between the spacecraft or the space station and the, the ground control center. If we go to the moon, it's still okay because the delay is going to be about a second, a second and a bit, uh, depending on the position of the moon in relation to, to, to the Earth. So it's 300,000 kilometers roughly. So it's going to be okay for the, uh, the communication because it's, it's done in the speed of light. But if you go to Mars during your trip, you know, in, or when you are on Mars, let's say, then you are going to have this delay in communication that can range from three to four minutes to 22 to 24 minutes each way. And then at that precise moment, you know, if it's a medical emergency, a clinical situation, it's going to be more difficult on the ground to help or interact with the astronauts that should be also trained medically in some aspects, you know, some uh, small surgeries or the identification of some signs and symptoms. Uh, they should be able to handle some equipment to collect data and send to work. Uh, but of course, you are on Mars and you are basically by yourself. So that's why I believe that uh, we need to have a very good uh, intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence system you know, that can at least uh, give the first, let's say, evaluation of the astronaut in on Mars and maybe fill this gap you know, during the delay of in communication between the ground and the astronauts when something nasty happens there. And uh, basically try to manage, like diagnose or treat or manage the disease. So robots that can handle that or computers, very sophisticated, hyper sophisticated algorithms, mad algorithms that can uh, somehow uh, help with this uh, situation. Thais, I, I would like also uh, to introduce uh, Eloisa Odrich also in our conversation. Uh, she also has, uh, would like to add some questions to our conversation. Eloisa, please. Hi, Thais. Just wanted to say what a great honor it is to have you here. And you, this relationship that you made with learning from the astronauts, I thought it was extremely interesting. So, but I'm curious a little bit, how is the 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 days in i know it's very simple questions but perhaps some others are also a little bit curious about that yeah yeah, yeah. and the thing is also and i think it's a great question to the fact like how much privacy the astronauts have since they're monitored 24 hours a day and and also breaking the ice for so much movie type style we have of about the the, the whole space thing it's a great question no, no, for sure, and it's uh, it's uh, it's very important because that's the daily activity. You know what what you do when you wake up, and what's going to be uh, you know, in terms of the, your day, what's ahead of you. you know? So uh, one thing that we need to remember is that uh, I mentioned that the, the the space station, let's say, is 400 kilometers from Earth, and to keep to be in orbit, it has to travel at a speed of 27,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, for doing, doing that, it creates, um, it gives to us, the astronauts, 16 sunsets and 16 sunrises in 24 hours. So it's like to have 16 days in 24 hours, which can disrupt a bit the, the, the circadian rhythm of the astronauts. Of course, they don't go to sleep and wake up every 90 minutes, but it is like uh, uh, they have to have their clock, you know, they, they, uh, somehow connected to, to the control center, initial control center. Uh, or to use um, the Greenwich uh, Meridian time, for example. That, that there are ways that each mission, let's say, decide how to keep the time. But in any case, uh, when you, uh, the astronauts wake up, they, 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 try, they try to keep a very, let's say, common normal life in the sense that they wake up, they have their breakfast, they, they have uh, exercise to perform some point in time during the day, about two hours per day. That that has a mix of uh, aerobic ex exercise with resistive exercise. Uh, they, they, of course, they go to the toilet. It's not a, an easy task sometimes, but they go to the toilet. There is no shower in space, so they, they clean their body with, uh, 
uh, special uh, let's say, tissues with um, liquids that uh, can uh, can kill bacteria and so on. So it is. I always have the I, I have this joke with my friends that are engineers. Come on, we are going. We talk to go to Mars and we cannot have a shower in space. Wow. So let's improve that aspect. They have their meals, you know, their lunch, they have their dinner. Sometimes they have uh, together crews, uh, crews from different, um, uh, let's say, backgrounds or, or countries. You now they can come together. They have that inter moment of entertainment. They conduct research. They observe the Earth. They clean and maintain the spaceship, the space station. So it is. A, it's a very busy day. Uh, they, you mentioned about privacy. Yeah, sometimes it's not. Uh, it's not the, maybe the price that they want, but they, they have some moments that they have privacy to talk to their families. Uh, when they sleep, they have that sleeping bags that not necessarily are the, in the horizontal position. Sometimes they, they are just uh, connected to a wall or so you sleep in the vertical position, which is very counterintuitive for us because uh, since we were babies, we were sleeping in the horizontal position. So there are some so psychological issues sometimes with this um, aspect of a space mission. I had the opportunity to be in micrograms twice in my life during two campaigns of the uh, uh, European Space Agency parabolic flights, which gives you just short periods of microgravity, but long enough for you to conduct your research. I had two research, uh, uh, three studies, one in the first campaign related to the Karl Pulmonar resuscitation of astronauts. And the second one, it was related to the development of a medical device to be used in space missions. So two very different projects, but during this period of microgravity, you know, you float and you start working. It's really very, very different. You know? It's something that um, when I when I participated in the first campaign, I had done my PhD. I had finished my PhD. Uh, I think that's two years before, maybe two years uh, before. Yeah. And um, but so I was all my life, you know. Imagine uh, to be an astronaut, and I was like studying uh, uh, in the States, in the masters in aerospace medicine, and then a PhD in London, uh, doing conducting many studies with microgravity simulation here on Earth. So I was completely like, what is microgravity? <laughs> and then when I was in the parabolic flight, the first moment, the first time that I float, the the thing that crossed my mind was, this is microgravity. I was so happy because by till that time I was feeling that I was out of place. I was talking and studying and teaching about something that I never that I had never never, never have never experienced. So wow. it was um, an excellent moment, and uh, I think that the astronauts have fun uh, also with that. Nowadays they have moments of entertainment. They play music. They they. They talk to their families, uh, friends, so it's it's a different interaction. But just just to, to complete the idea of the privacy, and it is so important for the general public as we were discussing. That one of my 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 group of students in the in the Alt University in Finland, in, in Helsinki, that's that's um, the, in in Finland where I teach this module uh, space and design. That um, they have uh, uh, saunas everywhere, you know, like we have barbecue places in our in in Brazil, here in the south of Brazil, in every single house or apartment, they have saunas there. And so it, they, of course, motivated by their own culture, and they created a space sauna in wow. which it was like a kind of bubble uh, that the astronaut could get inside and have your, his or her privacy to talk to, the, to their families or to watch a movie or to listen to music. And they would be floating in this, uh, in this more like, say, warm type of environment. So it was a space sauna, and I like very much the idea because, of course, to to keep your privacy, to keep your moments with yourself or with your uh, friends and relatives, it's they are extremely important for your well-being and mental health. You know? So just to finalize this uh, answer with this uh, very, I think that's a very visual um, uh, thing, you know, to see a sauna like a balloon, a bubble where you can get inside and have this moment of privacy. Yeah. In Great Britain, we have uh, uh, the Sir Arthur Clarke Awards, where every year we recognize some specific presentations, productions, and the people who is more familiar with the science fiction, especially, especially the lit literature and, and history, they know who is 
Sir Arthur Clarke. I did a little research. He's a visionary. It was a guy who has some like, wow, his story is fantastic. But, and a good news is on this year, your work is, was nominated for such a special award. Can you please describe what is exactly yeah. the word and how that gonna work? Yeah, the, the, the work is, uh, is the project's called Kids to Mars. It was the first, in fact, first project of North Space. And when you launched uh, in North Space, you had nothing, you know, it was starting as I did with the microgravity center at PUC RS, just a computer attempt myself. So we just had nothing, and, but we wanted to give this idea that it was a company that was entering the market to be a, a, a very, to have global projects, inclusive, diverse, and so on, both in, in scientific projects and educational projects. So we started with Kids to Mars with the idea of involving kids from all over the world. So using the UN, uh, United Nations member states, 193 countries. So wow. to, to have all of them represented symbolically, represented because of course you cannot have a project involving kids from all these countries, all the kids from all these countries, but symbolically represented by a boy and a girl from six to 18, you know, a teenager or a, a child, um, asking a question, a video question, about Mars and the exploration of Mars by humans. And then we would match the question with an expert you know, in the field, uh, a space scientist, an analog astronaut, or even an astronaut if you have the chance to then answer the questions. Uh, so we create this map with the representation of all the countries that are involved. We, we are about, we have about 50 countries about involved. Some countries created a competition like in Israel, Pakistan, Guatemala, Tanzania, they created a competition uh, to select the first the questions, sometimes by invitation. So each country decides how it's going to be. And we get the questions, as I said, we produce the video and then uh, the, we get the answer, combine everything and we make, make it available in the map. So you can see the questions per country. And also in terms of, we created a, based on that one, um, uh, Mars Encyclopedia, which is we divided the questions in five main topics. And then if you are, let's say, plants and animals on Mars, then you just go to the questions related to uh, under this topic. And uh, so it's, it's an open access um, platform. So anyone in the world, adult, kid, teacher, you know, a school, whoever wants to learn about Mars, just go there and it's completely for free. We have also a section, session now that's, it's, um, it's a blog session for kids to write about the space experience. And in fact, Kids to Mars is under an umbrella called Kids to Space, because we want uh, also to create a project called Kids to the Moon or Kids to Moon, and then Kids to Orbit, for example. So you have other possibilities of uh, educational projects related to uh, space exploration by humans. And, um, and then we, we we are competing, let's say, somehow for the this Arthur Clark uh, Award. I don't know how it works precisely, but we had a huge support from colleagues, friends, and uh, space enthusiasts to to vote for us. Now. Let's see what happens. I saw uh, the winner, a kid from six years old, that he won in Israel, and you were showing and you were really explaining to him in, in a very clear way on why life in Mars, what are the challenges and so on. Uh, the whole program, I'm, I feel like that 60, six years old kid that I want to know so much more about the space that I do. But uh, Linus has a question regarding the hospitals and infrastructure, if we are going to live there. In the future, we will have more people present in space, living in space stations, on the moon, or even on Mars, we have to establish hospitals folks are living because we can't, uh, if we have many people in space, we, we must have those hospitals. And uh, we will have different time, kinds of uh, procedures and medical equipment, depending on we are using them in microgravity, in low gravity, or in uh, as an Earth on standard gravity. Or we will try to unify these procedures and medical equipment to something that works 
everywhere. And only for sure that I, I can uh, I can tell you that uh, this equipment that uh, are taken into space, you no know, medical equipment, you know, any kind of equipment, in fact, but let's take the, the medical equipment as an example. Uh, they have to go through a series of tests, you know, to let's say of guessing of the material, uh, vibration, shock, acceleration. Uh, if it is um, if it is breakable, so uh, it's very dangerous because if you break something in space, then the, 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 the let's say the, the broken glass will fly, you know, will fly, no, sorry, float, and it can enter the respiratory tract, the mouth, the, the, the eye of the astronauts, or, or basically damaging equipment around. So it's very it's very important to, to really design the equipment that can be used in space very carefully, considering all these uh, aspects of microgravity and so on. But when you are, let's say, on Mars one day and with a, uh, a colony there, no, I, I completely agree with you. You need to have a kind of a hospital with equipment that uh, uh, will be able to function in, in the uh, Mars environment. Uh, and it can be tested uh, here in labs on Earth plus in parabolic flights. In fact, this coming some Saturday, I'm going to give a lecture together with uh, uh, Dr. Vladimir Pletzer, who was the coordinator of the European Space Agency parabolic flights. Uh, campaigns uh, for 30 years or so. He's the world record in the number of planes that uh, perform parabolic, uh, which he performed parabolic flights. He has more than 7,000 parabolas. And uh, we are, it's a, a Nov Space course about space analogs. So it's called Discussing Space Analogs. And uh, his lecture, he's going to cover the, the simulation of this, of, of Moon and Mars environment. Uh, using this parabolic flight. So that's a moment, for example, to do what you were mentioning, to test the equipment, to, to, to see how viable it is to use in space or, or, or the moon or Mars. Plus, uh, you have to be trained how to collect data uh, from someone. I can tell you uh, by experience that when you are in microgravity, your, your, the relationship of your movement with the environment around you change, change completely. It becomes slower. You 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 have to find your way around. If you just touch a wall, you go to the to the opposite direction. So it's it's also important for the equipment to be let's say uh, adapted somehow to space. But also the, the the astronauts must be trained of how to use them in this type of environment because otherwise you're going to be lost. They are, they are trying to do an echocardiogram, for example. You don't know how to to use the equipment. Because everything changes, you know, the, the equipment might change, but beyond that is how, how you collect the data. So, very good question. Thank you. Is as much as I as I, I'm right impressed with all the, the 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 great answers you gave to us today. I'm very proud to proud be Brazilian as you to come from the same state, but also uh, as an important fact. You work in a field was dominated by a man, and that makes your work even like deeper on 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 establish that. And and I also I hear you also a part a mentor of the Space for Women, a program at the United Nations. And it's very important for you for us to know what is the how that is difficult for a woman be so successful on that field and bring for us some ideas because remember you could be as much as inspiration for another woman who watching us right now exactly. you know for sure it is a is a male dominant uh, dominant area it is uh, for sure that's no question uh, it's uh, the exploration of space is still very linked to the military which is also very male dominant so uh, it is uh, it's it's not let's it was not something that was new to me but, um, uh, and I can tell you that I started medicine. I was 15, 16 years old, so I was very young. I graduated, I, when I went to the United States to do my master's degree, uh, after doing my study medicine, doing my residence training, I was still very young you know, for, for that level of my career. And um, so I had everything possible against me. You know? I was a Latin woman, uh, a young Latin woman. What else do you need? <laughs> wow. So, 
it, it was, um, it, it, there is this barrier, of course. There is this invisible barrier that nobody assumes that it's there, but it is there. I remember that I used to say that I love to go to the toilet during uh, space medical congress because there was no queue. No? The queue was <laughs> the queue was with the boys' uh, <laughs> toilet. <no? laughs> so it was not, nobody was there, just me and a couple of uh, no, three or four other women. So the queue was no, no not existent. But um, I remember I think that what I can tell though you and the general public that could listen to this interview is that. Um, once uh, I was raised basically by my mother and my grandmother. My grandmother was a very impressive woman. She was born in 1919 and she became an important lawyer in Brazil. She wrote many books and she was the uh, emeritus professor at the School of Law in the University of um, Pelotas. So what happened uh, once is that I was in a, in, a, in a conference with them because I, I think that they took me because they did. They couldn't leave me alone. No, I was seven, eight years old. So I couldn't be alone at home. They took me to this conference. And then I was there and I was looking at my grandmother. She was the president of the, the society of law, constitutional law. And she had men on you know, both sides. She, there was this big table and she was in the middle with men both sides. And then the whole, let's say, audience was 90% 90, 90 were men. And then what I asked her was after that was, uh, I said, Grandma, what, how do you feel with so many men around you? And then she looked at me and I remember that she said, uh, I don't see men and I don't see women. I see people. And I think that it clicked in my mind in a way that, believe me, if I, I can be in front of a thousand men and I have to give a lecture or to do something, I just... I just go there and do my job. No, I'm not embarrassed or, or um, uh, how to say, not embarrassed, but um, uh, it doesn't In, create intimidated. any negative feelings. Intimidated. Um, intimidated, yeah. I don't, and uh, maybe because I was raised by two very strong women you know, at home, so uh, the money would come from, from their work. They, the, my mother was also a lawyer, was also a professor at the university. Any issue at home had to be solved by, by us, in fact, by them, you know, because I was a kid and, you know, growing up there. So it, it is, um, yeah, I think that that's, that's why we created at the North Space the project Valentina, which is to try to show these, uh, these models you know, of women in space as uh, something that is possible. Of course, I had the pleasure or, or the, the privilege, let's say, to have that at home for a long period of time. So I had a, I experienced that in my daily life, and I just became someone that, for me, it's is not something that embarrasses me or that makes me feel uncomfortable to be among men and or among women. I just don't care, as my grandmother very wisely said at that time. I just see people in front of me. I can see smart people and I can see stupid people. But it doesn't matter if they are men or women. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's coming from you. What's your the next plan, especially here today for our Go Person program? And you can tell us what's coming ahead and the plans for you, Thais. Yes, no, for sure. Um, there are uh, several different plans, but one of them is to uh, understand a bit more and try to explore the, the, this, um, this, the solar system that Sweden have, has in different cities. I, I understand there's about five cities in which you have the, you know, the, the first, let's say, four or five planets of the solar system in, in Stockholm, and then you have other cities involved with the other planets like Saturn and then Venus, uh, Neptune, and, uh, and so on. So I think that it would be in interesting to, uh, to join forces you know, with uh, uh, a Sweden, uh, Swedish institution to, um, to promote space science, space life science, human space exploration, giving lectures, interacting with the, the, the cities that somehow are, are dedicated, dedicate themselves to honor one of one or more planets of the solar system. I think that is a good combination. So my dream is to give a, a lecture about the planet linking to human space exploration for uh, kids or universities in each one of these cities. Something that could uh, uh, bring uh, lectures or knowledge connected to this uh, solar system. And I thought, well, maybe that would be a good motivation for people to, um, to attend the lectures or to, to, to learn more about space. 
fantastic. Yeah. You know, we we re, every week we come here with a, we got a new person, like we always call them a globe person, and you are the first one over the globe. So very <laughs> proud. It was a fantastic. We, we would like to say thank you very much, and then give us a little message of what's coming up, going to the future. What's coming? Well, uh, what I hear that is coming is that uh, space is going to be uh, uh, not the, the, the final frontier, but the next frontier in terms of it's going to be much more accessible to people. You know, space tourism that didn't start now, it's not starting now, it started back in 2001, but it was just for millionaires, billionaires. Now I believe that it's going to change. And uh, not just as we were discussing hostels on Mars, but hotels in, uh, in, in Earth's orbit to make it accessible and it will be much more popular. And I hope Nob Space can play a role just um, uh, basically sharing this, this message and this knowledge from top to bottom and left to right in the world and, and really without any political involvement, without any, um, uh, any let's say, extra gain in the sense that we, what we want is to democratize space and uh, I hope that's the next step, you know, that it's not just science fiction for the majority of people on earth, it's, it's science, it is something achievable and, uh, and if you have this dream, just follow it.